And I'd, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to go through a, a series of a PowerPoint presentation that I put together. Um, and I did that for my own personal use so that I could try to understand exactly what's going on or exactly what is not going on, but made to believe that it is going on. But first, <coughs> um, kind of recapping what I've just covered is in regards to a loan, a loan has to be that which is given by one in exchange for another. In other words, somebody loans you something and you owe some kind of obligation. It's, it's actually an expression of promises going two ways. And the first claim, again, uh, what, what the claims are is that they loan the depositors money or they use the bank's capital or they use the bank's notes. Those are the three primaries that I keep hearing that what the bank did. You ask a banker, where did the money come from? Well, you're one of them crazy people that, you know, th it came from the depositor's money. You know, they always assume because you ask a question that it in fact, you're just crazy, you're, you're uh, believing propaganda, you're part of some internet scam, or what they do um, <clears throat> is try to do what I call a character assassination. Um, and that's not what I'm really here for. I just really want to know the answer. It's, is it yes or is it no? Well, you're just part of an internet scam. Um, is that a yes or no? I mean, just answer the question. I mean, if you answer the question, then there can't be no internet scam because it would be answered at that point in time. Um, so anyways, of the three different possibilities that I've, hear, that I've heard, um, we've deflated the, the theory that it can be the depositor's money. Um, number two, it can't be the bank's capital because that'd be a federal violation. And it can't be the bank's notes. Okay, because that again uh, is deflated with several statutes, code, and court cases. So, where did it come from? One thing that I've found inside of this book in, in the seven or eight years of study is their definition of the word reserves. Now, when you hear a bank talk about their reserves, or their what they call vault cash. Um, one would assume that you're believing that they have a safe in the back room and that's the vault and that's where the, the, the money's kept. However, that's not what the Federal Reserve defines it as. Again, here we go back to the rectum theory. You think you're sitting on a rectum, but in law, it's a trial or accusation. Again, inside of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors book on their purposes and functions, on page 141, it gives a clear definition of what reserves are, or should I say their definition of what reserves are. <clears throat> reserves, a depository institution's vault cash up to the level of its required reserves, plus balances in its reserve account, not including funds applied to required clearing balance. Um, well, for the layman, why don't they just say, the cash that's in the in the vault is that not what they interpret and make people believe they represent to people that reserves are what the bank has from the people depositing money that's stored in their little bank vault in the back room that's not nearly what that meant matter of fact that's actually quite confusing but it breaks off into three sections down here and it says required reserves funds that a depository institution is required to maintain as vault cash or on deposit with the Federal Reserve Bank. In other words, is the depositor's money actually going into the Federal Reserve Bank? Or is there something else called reserves that goes into the Federal Reserve Bank? Because it says right here, deposits with the Federal Reserve Bank. <clears throat> required reserve balance. Portion of its required reserves that depository institution must hold in an account at a Federal Reserve Bank. Well, th this again amplifies that there's something other than depositors' money as reserve being held at the Federal Reserve Bank. But I also look at that as the Federal Reserve Bank is ordering and requiring. It, it's a requirement. A requirement is a shall. That's an order. They're ordering the bank to keep a surplus of money or reserves, excuse me, not money, reserves, in the Federal Reserve Bank. Well, that tells me that the very bank that we're t 
talking about here, whichever one it be, is actually acting for the Federal Reserve Bank, which ties into the banks are an agency or an agent of the Federal Reserve Bank by their own admission here. It proves two different things. And then they've got one for excessive reserves, which is amount of reserves held by an institution in excess of its reserve requirements and required clearing balance. <clears throat> this brings me back to what are these reserves that they're talking about? Reserves. Well, the reserves can be deposits at the bank or deposits at the Federal Reserve Bank in their vault at bank, I'll call it. Okay? Well, what are they depositing at the Federal Reserve Bank? To me, after careful study, you have to go back to who? Who is the bank? Well, if the bank is an agent for the Federal Reserve Bank, if that's true, just hypothetically, I believe they are, but we'll just let this stand. If they are an agent for the Federal Reserve Bank, <clears throat> they talk you into signing this note. However, when you get into what is this note, you're leaving who the bank is. Who is the bank? The bank is an agent for the Federal Reserve, which one would believe that now that the bank is actually an agent for the government. Well, who in this country is authorized to make money? Who has the power to create money? And I've heard some people come back and say, well, the Federal Reserve Bank. Okay, I, I can accept that uh, after you show me the delegation of authority. Where is the delegation of authority for the Federal Reserve Bank to make money? Well, it's simple. Act of Congress. Okay, I'll buy that as long as you can show me the proper delegation of authority Congress gave to them or Congress received itself to make money. According to the Constitution, the Constitution has the authority to place the weights and measures to money. In other words, to tell us how much it's worth, not to make it. Well, Dan, that's crazy. Congress writes bills and bonds all the time. They're making money. Why? Where'd they get that delegation from? What a lot of people seem to miss is that a statute itself, or an act, statutes at large, create a fiduciary duty on the Congress. In other words, they write a statute down that is their obligation and duty to the people to safeguard that which we put in them. They are representing us. So when they write one of them statutes, they actually assume a trustee fiduciary duty for the people based on the written statute or intent of Congress that's publicly announced to people. Well, holding a fiduciary duty, a fiduciary has the right to go and do that based on its constituents, so to speak. So without people's knowledge, the Congress is just writing all these things based upon their assumed fiduciary to do so in the name of the people. Again, my whole point is Congress has to get the power from the people to do that. Well, if Congress has to get that power from the people, then that would only tell me that the Federal Reserve Bank would have to get the authorization from the people. And it lines up with this. The bank can't use depositors' money. They can't use its own capital. It can't use its own notes, which means this note must be yours, and your signature is granting the authorization for them to make money and to be your fiduciary while doing so, keeping that deposit with the Federal Reserve Bank so it doesn't show on the books. I don't believe the Federal Reserve Bank makes money out of thin air. I believe that we're authorizing the Federal Reserve Bank to make that money off of this, and the bank then, according to their own standards, creates a book entry asset in their favor based upon this. And that's what they're claiming to loan you. Well, if that's true, you just loaned yourself that money. Where's the bank's right? Who is the bank, if that's true, who is the bank to take your money out of your pocket, call it the banks, give it back to you as a loan, and then steal your house as a result of taking your money? That's the only thing that this can be. We've done a process of elimination, and these are no longer there. 
So where did it come from? That's the only thing that it could be because the bank can't use any other three and the only other party to that transaction at that specific time is you and the bank. You and the bank are sitting across the table. The bank can't use depositors money, it can't use the bank's capital, it can't use bank notes. The only other evidence is this note with your authorization. Well if you authorize them to make that money it's only true that it's your money to begin with. Unless, of course, you were grossly misled into just handing the bank uh, $115,000 and say, here's $115,000, why don't you loan it back to me and I'll give you 8% over 30 years. Otherwise, they're admitting to fraud and gross misrepresentation over here. Or, they are admitting to fraud and gross misrepresentation by not clearly telling and disclosing all the facts to the... Uh, to this issue that was what that was contracted to and again that brings us back to contract law where <clears throat> I found inside of Corbin's on contracts which is one of the most authoritative sources for contracts um, in the section about voidable contracts and void contracts itself <clears throat> the the term validity as applied to contracts is a variable signification there are varying degrees of validity an oral contract which this is not <clears throat> within the statute of frauds is unenforceable under some circumstances but it has a high degree of validity. In the case of a voidable contract there's usually both a power to avoid and a power to validate by ratification the agreement to some extent. <clears throat> and a void contract again is one that never really existed. Um, what I'm going to do is I want to go to a couple of court cases again on that very nature because I think the judges say it best when you're talking about a certain topic. And this topic is contracts. I mean, everybody can agree that that's a contract. Agreements and contracts are basically synonymous in terms as far as I'm concerned. If that's not true, I'm, I'm always impeachable. I'm just a researcher. Contracts. Here's a whole bunch of contract cases. Okay. <clears throat> Here's the... The first case on contracts. Nothing can be more material to the obligation than the means of enforcement. Without the remedy, the contract may indeed, in the sense of law, be said to not exist, and its obligation to fall within the class of those moral and social duties which depend for their fulfillment wholly upon the will of the individual. The ideas of validity and remedy are inseparable, and both are parts of the obligation which is the guaranteed by the Constitution against invasion. The obligation of a contract is the law which binds the parties to perform their agreements. Well, in order to have an obligation, according to this court case, there has to be a valid remedy. What's the valid remedy for getting your money back from the bank that they stole you and told you was their money in a loan form? That would show it rendered obsolete. The, it is essential to the creation of a contract that there be a mutual or reciprocal assent or agreement. In other words, both parties have to clearly agree to it. Yes, I did, or yes, I may have signed this contract, but how many times, to drive this one home, I really want this all on the camera too, how many times do you go to a mortgage company and they come up to you and say, we have 15 minutes to lunch. Do you have a pen and are you ready? Sure. Sign here. What is that? Don't worry about it. Something with HUD. Sign here. What's that? Don't worry about it. That one right there just says we have authorization. Sign here. Okay, what's that? That's the mortgage. Whoop, you sign over here too. What for? Just double disclosure. It's a HUD requirement. Okay, great. Sign here. What, is there an easier way to do this? Yeah, you can sign faster. <clears throat> That's the contention that most of these mortgage companies have is I'm in a hurry. We need to get these papers done. Was that full disclosure? Did they give you time to read that stuff? Absolutely not. And I'm not saying that every one of them do that, but everybody that I've talked to, they go in there and they are rushed, they're nervous, they're scared, and they don't have a clue to what's going on because the mass population believes that you went to that bank and simply did one thing. You borrowed the bank's money, the bank's capital, their own money, and now you're obligated to pay that bank back. And that's not what happened. And that, in law, 
is gross misrepresentation, which is a void contract, not a voidable contract. It never existed from the beginning because there was not mutual agreement. The, that the assent to be certain and definite proposition, wow, the agreement, the assent, be to a certain and definite proposition. You're certain and you're definitely positively certain that you went and borrowed the bank's assets and now you're obligated to pay it back. If that's the case, then that contract is not void. But I don't think that's the case. Without a meeting of the minds of the parties on an essential element, there can be no enforceable contract. Okay? <clears throat> well, how many elements are involved in just these two pages, which is the mortgage or a deed of trust and the note. How many elements? Well, there's 23 sections. I didn't ask how many sections there were. How many elements? What is it? What does it do? How does it perform? What's going to happen later? Can it be used later? Was that fully disclosed? Each and every element, according to this case, each and every element, there has to be a meeting of the minds. In order for there to be a meeting of the minds, there has to be a disclosure of what your mind is interpreting to me so we can have a meeting of that same part of the mind. It just If it's not there, it just doesn't exist. In order to form a contract, the parties must have a distinct understanding common to both and without doubt or difference. Without doubt or difference. Without a doubt. All you did was loan me your capital and now I'm paying you back, right? Yes. Well, if that's true, if that's true, why is it that the bank demands the original note at closing? I got an idea for you. How about I keep the original and I'll certify it being a true copy. I'll get you a certified true copy and give the bank a certified true copy. Because if it's what they induce us and have made the mass amount of people believe that it's just a loan of assets, in exchange for a loan, they have no problem with giving us the original and them keeping a copy. But they won't do that. Why not? How can there be a meeting of the minds if there's any element gone, if there's no meeting of the minds, if there's no absolute disclosure for there even to be a meeting of the minds? That's why contract law falls right into this uh, so heavily. And actually, under the Uniform Commercial Code, you're going to find that the contract laws back up all of the information that's supplied here through banking which confirms everything that's in the statute. <clears throat> Until the terms of the agreement have received the assent of both parties, the negotiation is open and imposes no obligation on either. The assent of each party must be freely given a contract entered into as a result in the exercise of duress or undue influence by the other party or procured by fraud of one of the parties lacks the essential element of real assent and may not be avoided by the injured, injured party and excuse me and may be avoided by the injured party so in other words all these are kind of just amplifying each other that there has to be a clear distinct mutual assent of the meeting of the minds of each and every element of that contract otherwise there is no contract And now to the PowerPoint. <clears throat> Again, one of the first things that I wanted to do was I needed to clearly understand the parties. Who am I and who is the bank? Now, <clears throat> you start going into Black's Law because you're under the impression that this is a legal matter, so you should use the legal book, which is the Black's Law Dictionary. Black's Law Dictionary a bank is defined as a bench or a seat, the bench of the justice, the bench of the tribunal occupied by the judges, the seat of judgment or a court. That doesn't make any sense at all to what common people think. The bank is now the seat of the judgment. <clears throat> Going down a little further, it also defines it as an establishment for the custody, loan, exchange, or issue of money. For the extension of credit, Facilitating, transmitting the funds, a table, the table, counter, a place of business, a money changer, person conducting gambling house or a dealer, or supplies of something held in reserves, 
something held in reserve, fund of supplies, money, chips, pieces, held by the banker or dealer. Interesting. Going into that wonderful code, United States Code, Chapter 17, Title 12, 1841, this defines a bank as an insured bank. Well, if someone was to drive through the teller and see that nice, wonderful FDIC sticker out there saying all our money is FDIC insured, I would have to agree that that's an insured bank. Uh, as defined in Section 38 of the FDIC Act, by golly, there it is, the FDIC sticker and the FDIC itself as amplifier. Now, this institution organized under the laws of the United States, any state of the United States, District of Columbia, blah, 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 some over and others, which both accepts demand deposits or deposits that the depositor may withdraw by check or similar means for payment of third parties and others and is engaged in the business of making commercial loans. Well, that's 99% of all these, quote, mortgage companies and banks. A mortgage company accepts a deposit, accepts demand deposits, and they're engaged in making commercial loans. <clears throat> Next one. I went to 1813. I'm going to flip back for a second because this one here told you to go to 3H of 1813. Well, if you go to, <coughs> excuse me, 1813, you're going to see that bank and related terms, the definition of bank means any national bank, state bank, district bank, federal branch, and insured branch. That lumps them all into one one lump sum. So now it really doesn't matter if it's a state bank or if it's a, a bank holding company or any of the like. I know a lot of people have said, well, we're a state bank. We're, we're regulated under different rules. Uh, no, well, we're, we're, a, we're a credit union. We're regulated under different rules. Well, that's fine, and I'll conditionally accept that as long as you're telling me that the Federal Reserve Bank's own publication, as soon as I can find it here, uh, is lying to the people because uh, they point blank tell inside of their own book. Matter of fact, they not only tell you about it, they show you a nice picture of it. And it is right here. Nice little picture showing you, again, what all is part of the Federal Reserve Bank. It's, I mean, it's, it's their book. Again, this is published by the Board of Governors, not just the regular Federal Reserve. This is from the Board of Governors. The Federal Reserve, purpose and functions, not only shows you a picture, but it talks about who member banks are and what member non-member banks are and how non-member banks have to um, abide by the same rules. So it doesn't matter if you're a member bank or a non-member bank, and it doesn't matter if you are a commercial bank, an agricultural bank, a bank holding company, an industrial bank, a neighborhood bank, uh, another community bank, drive-in bank, all those are defined as a bank, again, as just as it stated here in the FDIC Act. <clears throat> that picture also does demonstrate and proves that they're all lumped up under the Federal Reserve, meaning that they're all agents to the Federal Reserve as well. <clears throat> now, what I like to do when I do research is, um, one, we, we looked at a lot of court cases and we looked at a lot of code and we looked at some statutes, um, but there's some other parts of the equation that I also do research on because what I like to do is if I, if I have a topic, I want to make sure that the United States Code matches what I'm thinking. I want to make sure that the courts have agreed on what I'm thinking. I want to make sure that the Uniform Commercial Code, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more here later, uh, I want to make sure that the Uniform Commercial Code matches. I want to make sure that it passes a smell test. I mean, okay, now that I have this information, does this make sense to me? And uh, obviously, I also want to make sure that it matches with like the uh, intent of Congress. Now, here is an act. This is the Bank Holding Company Act. Just so that we get clarity, we went from the FDIC to the Federal Reserve, and now we're going into the Holding Company Act. Uh, definition of bank means any of the following. An insured bank, an insured organization, which both accepts demand deposits or deposits that the depositor may withdraw and is engaged in the business making commercial loans. That sounds very familiar to what the Federal Reserve said under the uh, 12 U.S.C. 1813, the FDIC and the Federal Reserve uh, Acts. Now here, <clears throat> this is a different part of law. This is 12 Code of Federal Regulations. The Code of Federal Regulations is like the internal mechanisms. Uh, for example, a statute is passed, there's an agency within the government that controls that certain topic, and they create the Code of Federal Regulations, which are the internal rules for that agency regarding that topic. And then you have the United States Code, which is 
the legalese taking an interpretation of the statute and codifying it into United States Code. So this is the internal Code of Federal Regulations under banks and banking, which fall under the Office of the Comptroller of Currency, which fall under the Department of the Treasury. Bank means a national bank, including a federal branch, as defined in Part 28 of this chapter, with federally insured deposits, uh, except as provided in 2511C. Now, 2511C, this part applies to all banks except as provided in C2 and C3 of this section. C2 and C3 are right here. Federal branches and agencies. This part applies to all insured federal branches. Any federal branch that is uninsured that results from an acquisition described in uh, the International Banking Act. And then C3, certain special purpose banks. This part does not apply to special purpose banks that do not perform commercial or retail banking services by granting credit to the public in ordinary course of business. I've heard several people that uh, called me up and said, hey, uh, I was in court, and, and I asked the banker um, and the attorney if the bank loaned me their own capital. And it's amazing that the bank won't answer this question, especially in court. I mean, you are there to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yeah, obviously, we're in court. Why would that question be so hard to answer? Did you loan me your own capital, yes or no? Well, if they say no to it, then obviously they don't have an any, any rights as standing. If they say yes to it, I recall Section 35 and 37 of the actual statute intent of Congress stating that's a federal violation for them to use their own capital. So they're kind of caught in a catch-22. However, what the attorneys and bankers have answered when they do answer, if you can get the banks or attorneys to answer, is no, we didn't loan our capital, we extended credit. Well, what's an extension of credit? <clears throat> an extension of credit is a loan. They extended you something. There, there's obvious value to that credit. So if they loaned you credit, then it's still a loan. It's still an exchange of value for value. So it's still a loan. So is that a yes or a no? They won't answer that question. Did you loan us your own capital stock? No, we extended credit. Well, was that a yes or a no? They won't answer that question. Well, that tells me that they didn't loan me anything. Why? Otherwise, they would just answer the question. So all we want to do is just get the questions answered. So <clears throat> this goes through, and what it does, after it starts talking about this extension of credit by certain special purpose banks, it gives a reference to this 12 U.S.C. 24 seventh, which comes in very helpful later. <clears throat> 12 U.S.C. Chapter 3, Section 222, Federal Reserve District's Membership of National Banks. Um, I want to bring this one to home because this one tells you that every national bank in any state shall, upon commencing business within 90 days after admission to the Union, the state which it is located, become a member of the Federal Reserve. Okay, every national bank is a member of the Federal Reserve. It's clearly identified by the statute. Okay, and if they don't do it, then their um, penalty provided by Section 501A of this title, okay? Failure to do so shall subject the bank to the penalty in 501A. So they have to be a member of the Federal Reserve. Or 501A is forfeiture of franchise. If they don't become a member, they forfeit their franchise. They're done. Bye. Forfeiture of franchise. There is no franchise. There is no national bank. So you have to be a member of the Federal Reserve Bank, as clearly described right here. Okay, and again, that gives you 12 U.S.C. 21 at SEC, um, and again, shall be forfeited. Down here, it talks about that director again. I mentioned that out of Section 9 of Title 62 earlier, which is part of 13 Stat 99. <clears throat> Every director who participated in or assented to the same shall be held liable in his personal or individual capacity for all damages which any other person shall have sustained in consequence of such violation. So... The lawyer and the bank, banker, are not liable. However, the directors are. And I think a lot of people are losing a lot of their ammunition by dealing with customer service, who really doesn't know anything other than, you know, you want to catch up no, no mustard and pickles on your hamburger. Uh, in the legal department, who knows how to codify the original intent of Congress to make it sound like something that it's totally not, when in fact, in reality, they know darn well that the statute is a very easy, simple understanding of what con Congress's intent is. So why do they go into the legalese mumbo-jumbo of anything else? It's beyond me. <clears throat> now there's 12 U.S.C. 21 is where it said uh, they uh, on the last screen. 
uh, regarding they'd have to forfeit or become a member of the Federal Reserve. And this says formation of national banks. Now, associations for carrying on the business of banking under Title 62 of the revised statutes. Number one, that tells us that we need to go to Title 62 and that the formation of national banking is governed by Title 62 of the revised statutes. Now, these sections are copy and paste. I've inflated some, made some red, and underlined them to bring some parts out. But there is no change in words, commas, punctuations, or anything else on here. These are exact words right from the statute. Now, here it says also that they shall enter into articles of association which shall spe specify in general terms the object for which the association is formed, not inconsistent with law. These articles shall be signed by the persons uniting to form the association, and a copy of them shall be forwarded to the comptroller of currency and be filed and preserved in his office. Therefore, now we know under the FOIA laws that we can get a hold of the comptroller of the currency when dealing with a national bank and find out who the directors are and get a copy of their articles of association and what their general terms are to make sure that they're not inconsistent with the law. Very, very informative information. Now, <clears throat> again, I touched on this just a minute ago. Um, I've spoken to many bankers and lawyers when I talked to uh, certain lawyers. I said, well, have you ever read Title 62 of the revised statutes? And they said, it only goes up to 50. And I said, well, the statutes at large is where the code came from. No, we use the code. Okay, I'm glad you use the code, but the code is based on the statute. And pretty much I was laughed at by these, by these lawyers because you don't know procedure, you don't have a bar license. Um, actually, I, I don't, I don't, they're, they're not even state licensed. They have a license from the American Bar Association, but they don't have a license from the state. So, anyways, I, I'll, that's a whole different topic. So what I did <clears throat> is I went to the uh, Cornell Law, went into Title 12, and they had a little search box up there, and I typed in Title 62 of the Revised Statute, and it brought back 30 different, 33 different results. In other words, 33 different sections of Title 12 referred to or mentioned Title 62 of the Revised Statute. U.S. Code, general provisions, the FDIC, corporate powers of associations fall under it, FDIC fall under it, violations of provisions fall under it, banking powers and duties of banks fall under it, power to hold real property falls under it. So you can kind of see that quite a few of these sections actually go back to Title 62, which means two things to me. One, the lawyers are wrong when they say Title 62 has been repealed or it's too ancient, we shouldn't use it, because the law as written today still refers to it. And number two, it shows me that the statute still superior to the code. <clears throat> And here is those sections again that I've already covered. I told you it was in the PowerPoint. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to go back and, and again restate some of the portions and court case decisions and court case holdings regarding why the statute is always supreme to the code. Uh, again, it gives a description of what positive law is, law actually and specifically enacted or adopted by proper authority for a government and general society. Prima facie is at first sight. It's again that Corvette without an engine. Looks like a great car at first sight, but in fact it's not because it don't have an engine. Statutes at large, legal evidence of law contained therein and accepted as proof of those laws in any court of the United States. And unless Congress affirmably enacts title of the United States Code into law, title is only prima facie evidence of law, which again, prima facie is presumably a fact to be true unless disproved by evidence to the contrary. In other words, it's evidence unless you can bring forth the statute to rebut it. Where title has not been enacted in a positive law, title is only prima facie or rebuttable evidence of the law. And if construction is necessary, recourse may be had to the original statutes themselves. Even codification in the positive law, if they did enact it in a positive law, or say they did, uh, precedents where there is a conflict between that codification and the statutes at large. In other words, <clears throat> even codification does not give the code precedent with the statutes at large. It's easier said over here, United States Code does not prevail over statutes at large when the two are inconsistent. Inconsistent to me means any difference. If they take a comma out, if they put, take a period out, or if they add a comma, or if they add and, and instead of uh, and, if they add an and or, that would be a change, and that means that you need to go back to the statutes at large because it's inconsistent with the true intent of Congress. <clears throat> Although United States Code establishes prima facie what laws uh, of the United States are, to the extent provisions of the United States Code are inconsistent 
with the statutes at large, statutes at large will prevail. Again, the statutes, the statutes, the statutes. I know they're a little harder to get to. Uh, they made them harder to get to, I think, for a specific reason. Again, going off gross misrepresentation. But get to a library and get some of them comments, uh, some of the statutes. Or um, half a million people decide, hey, let's start making this publicly noticed. Put it online for us. If enough people complain, maybe they'll do that. Maybe they won't. <clears throat> Again, when a loan is intentionally made by an insured bank, one tends to believe they were loaned the bank's